folks, and welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. The summer holiday is just about done. Kids are still off school for a few days, but parents, ourselves included, are already in full swing. Offices are open and business is back on track uh, here in Japan after the Obon holiday, which ended last week. We're also back in the saddle here at NTI and carrying right through from last week's episode in which we took a first glance at a potential hotel deal that we're facilitating the sale of. So this week's episode is a recording of a conference call with one of the potential buyers for the resort. Now, if you've listened to the previous episode, and if not, it might be a good idea to do that before listening to the rest of this one. We're talking about a ski resort, hotel, or more accurately, a yokan, traditional Japanese inn, just a couple of minutes walk from the uh, ski lifts in Niigata Prefecture, which is quite popular for ski. And that one's being offered at a very low price due to a personal change of circumstances for the current owners who are finding themselves obligated to sell. So 26 rooms built in several stages from 1981, recently renovated and fully operational. Also with an active online presence, excellent reviews on bookings.com. So this conference call that you're going to listen to is between the potential buyer, or one of the potential buyers, a Singapore investor, Paul Feinberg from Pacific Business KK in Tokyo, whose company is our designated uh, potential operator for the resort, and yours truly. So it's really a Q&A brainstorming session during which we're floating ideas for increasing potential income and reducing operating costs, as well as floating a few questions that were then referred back to the sellers to make sure to uh, stick around for the summary because that'll come right after the call itself. And we're already going to present the answers to those questions because we've already received them. So enjoy, and I'll speak to you again after the call ends. Okay, so um, you've had a look at the um, the files that I've sent. First, do you have any questions about any of those files? Well, I would like to have um, more colors about the uh, current operation, and then the uh, the suggestion or the plan that the uh, the revenues and the business could be further enhanced uh, on this property. Okay, so we've, we've got some basic data about their expenses and their income in the last two years since they set up. And they're running negative now, but a lot of that from what I see is uh, due to the renovations and the licensing and the company setup that they've done. Um, having, having said that, um, that is definitely a place that's operating under capacity. So I've had feedback from quite a few people who, um, who know that location and say that it's a very good area um, in close proximity to the ski slopes and uh, very popular for winter tourism. But it looks like even during the winter, they're not having very much action there. Um, from my conversations with them, that might be more a case of them being outstretched um, management-wise. Um, and I'm just guessing, but maybe not really doing um, any active advertising and marketing beyond just having those um, online entries at the booking.com, etc. Um, so uh, in my conversations with Paul, and I think, um, Paul, you can probably step in now, um, he's had some ideas from his experience and... Uh, just from the general look of things that he think might be able to uh, boost things, not just during the winter season, but off season as well. Yes, we <coughs> discussed a variety of different social media types of advertising and blogs about the property. Um, somebody needs to definitely visit the property and explore the area. Uh, we also discussed finding out if there's any glamping operations operating in the area that might offer excursions to guests who are there in the off-peak season because the area has a lot of nature. Um, we just felt that there was other activities and other things that could be done to uh, draw guests to the property. So when you're saying glamping, you're talking about um, like really well-organized camping and hiking tours, right? Yes, um, that took off and the West a couple of years back and it's starting to make a strong presence here in Japan as well now. Okay, and when you say other operators, what, what sort of operations are you uh, referring to? I want to find out what the attractions are in the local area, what kind of things could be promoted to attract guests in uh, non-ski season uh, times. Okay, and would that also be um, with the same sort of setup, hotel, or do you think there's room to uh, maybe 
um, make it more of a guest house kind of thing or maybe um, cheaper during off season but attracting different types of guests anything like that yes I think you have to explore multiple configurations with the property and it should be done in such a way where it's easily converted from one configuration to another uh, in addition I think uh, corporations should be approached for using it for getaways for executives or seminars or retreat location um, I, I don't know and we won't know unless we ask the people who own it now if uh, any of those ideas have been explored or pursued uh, we'll ask but I'm guessing no I'm, I'm pretty certain it's probably no also because um, I don't I, Ziv are the current owners Japanese no, they're an uh, Australian couple, and they've got another silent Australian uh, partner who's actually in Australia. Okay. But their I guests, still, their clientele seems to be, uh, a fair amount of the clientele seems to be Japanese, so I'm guessing they either um, uh, speak Japanese or they've got some way of dealing with those. Or, or, I mean, basically they took it over and they did their reform and renovation, but... And maybe they, you know, didn't do much of a marketing plan or pursue any kinds of uh, uh, different uh, options for uh, improving the occupancy rates. Right. That that's definitely. And also, it's only been two years, so um, I would guess it would take them a bit longer than that to uh, build if they started from scratch. But in any case, uh, due to their personal circumstances, they need to sell, so they don't have any more time. Right. So. Um, Yes, they need to. I mean, we, we, we need to. We need to answer to all these questions. But um, the place certainly seems to have potential. The price is awfully low. <clears throat> Nigat does a famous area for everything from sake to rice and many other things. And uh, there's certainly a lot of nature up there. You have the mountains and you have the ocean. So one would think. I mean, even you know, fishing excursions. One would think that there's got to be things that can be uh, put together to attack, attract either groups, uh, tours, guests. Um, you know, nature retreats, other kinds of activities. It's quite an extensive list. It would take work, obviously, to put it all together. You <clears throat> have to contact all of these different organizations, make arrangements with them for some kind of group rate, uh, then, you know, promote everything uh, via social media and web advertising. And uh, obviously, approaching all the uh, OTAs, online travel agents that uh, are specialists with trips to Japan, like my friend Michael, who has a travel agency here in Tokyo and organizes tours for worldwide. <coughs> um, companies like that could uh, definitely promote the place and bring in groups of people. Okay, and um, I was looking at their Booking.com reviews and um, well, people were very, um, very supportive of them and their operations in the resort itself. They mentioned that that area, and that, that's again, that's something that we see in a lot of onsen and ski areas, doesn't really have much to offer as far as um, bars, restaurants, places to eat goes, just within walking distance to the resort. They've also got a building on the premises that can definitely be converted into a maybe izakaya type um, bar snack and the resort itself has a big kitchen and a big dining room which would be a shame to only keep utilizing for breakfast I think there's very um, very good potential for a restaurant on site as well um, you could also right now in Japan craft beer is booming and there's a you know a few hundred probably uh, very small um, craft beer operations um, one of the challenges for them is always a location. It'd be interesting to maybe approach some of these kinds of places or some other types of craft of uh, uh, food and beverage uh, operators and see if they'd be interested in doing anything at that location. And that would definitely bring in guests. Okay, and then they'd bring the uh, brewing licenses with them, I guess. Requires more research as to how they do that in Japan. If it's uh, license goes with the name or the license goes with the property, but the answer ultimately is yes. Okay. Um, do, do you have any any questions? Well, um, with regard to the license, I uh, I think more has uh, touched about that. Uh, would it be uh, coming with the property or would it be coming with the operator? In other words, uh, if, say, for example, uh, I invest in, the, uh, in, in this uh, property, 
uh, do I need to reapply for the license? And then the follow-up question would be, uh, uh, what about the booking for the uh, upcoming season? You know, how is it looking and whether um, the uh, new investor in the property can uh, inherit, you know, those uh, booking and those, uh, uh, say, uh, revenues or business? Well, for the first part, the license, at least the business license and the food and beverage license are non-transferable. So you will need, if you don't have a Japanese company set up yet, you will need to set one up. Um, the price of the uh, setup uh, compared with the price of the property is, is not a big expense. So I think it's uh, somewhere between two to four thousand dollars to set up a company and then the rest of the licenses are probably a good few thousand dollars uh, beyond that, but I'm guessing, Paul can probably correct me, but I'm guessing the total wouldn't be more than 10,000 for all licenses involved. Is that right, Paul? I haven't been involved with this process before because I haven't done, uh, ever, I've never had to uh, do the food and beverage side. Oh, no, no, not the food and beverage, but I mean the license for the budget hotel kind of thing. Uh, the budget hotel? Yeah. Properties are already built to specifications, obviously, to operate as a hotel. So it may not be anything at all. It may be just the uh, you need to have an architect sign off on the application, which that can cost money because they have to review the plans. And um, they'll do an appraisal for you. They always will. There's many, many companies and people you can contact for that. And then <coughs> the process itself. Um, I've had friends that actually have done it on their own, but I mean, in this case, probably you would hire a GSA associate. And um, well, my one experience with Regalia Minami Azabu, that guy was uh, Nijiko Man Yen, so 250,000 Japanese yen, about <clears throat> it's a little over $2,500 USD, I guess. Okay, yeah, that's been that's been my experience with the business licensing too. Um, so probably, I'm not sure about food and beverage, we'll have to look into that, but just to get the place operational, you're probably looking at something like five or six thousand dollars in total for the company set up and the uh, basic license. Um, with the uh, second question, with the bookings, they've got advanced bookings in the system for the f next season or two, um, which they estimate are worth about four million yen in bookings, whether these bookings will all go through or some of them will be cancelled or not, we've got no idea. But at least I'd say for the next uh, coming uh, ski season, you will have a starting go. Like you won't have to start from scratch. I would assume so. I would, I, you know, in the in the different operations that I run here in Tokyo, um, Marketing campaigns, you feel the effects of the marketing campaigns within usually a month, month and a half. And then from there, it uh, slowly escalates and goes up as you build more momentum. Um, the biggest hassle with starting the new campaigns, especially if you're using a variety of portal websites or channels or online travel agents, is there's an application process that usually takes at least two weeks. And once you're approved and you have your account open, then you can begin <clears throat> posting your properties and their photos. Uh, and you normally, if it's a good property, you normally see immediate results. Um, we've always gotten results, um, and very rarely have our results been poor. Uh, most of the time, we uh, good to excellent results with uh, promoting our properties. Uh, this one is a little different, obviously, since it's in Niigata and it's technically a ski resort. So again, the, the critical factor is what, what can be offered from that property, what can be offered from that area, what kind of organizations exist in that area that you can have agreements, types, contracts with to uh, promote the property to groups or individuals for various activities. Um, if you've got enough attractive things, you'll certainly have guests. So I'm guessing the game plan is to first of all make sure that we're uh, continuing with the flow that they've got for the winter season, as small as it might be and then uh, build from that with any extracurricular activities and so forth, right? I would say so. Okay. Yeah. And um, um, with regard to the, um, say, uh, to the company that the uh, Australian team is currently running, is it, you know, uh, 
uh, kind of a standalone company just uh, for the sake of uh, owning and running the property. The reason why I'm asking that is whether it is an alternative to, instead of uh, buying the property, uh, to acquire the company all together with the license and everything so that uh, we can ensure the continuity of the business. Would, would it be an option? Um, I've asked them about that. For them, from a tax perspective, it's better not to sell the business. Uh, regardless, though, when the business changes ownership, I think the licenses need to apply, be applied for again. So you might be able, if we can convince them to transfer that, you might be able to save on the company setup. But that's just, um, like Paul said, somewhere between two to four thousand dollars. It's not going to make the licensing any easier, though. Understood. And uh, the other thing is um, uh, about the uh, staff and the uh, hiring. Uh, if my intention is to say uh, to hire a professional team or professional management company to run the business instead of running by myself, uh, what options uh, could I have? And would there be some local uh, uh, hotel management company that could be the partner to run the business? Well, that's Paul. That's what Paul does. Paul, yes. Paul, can you explain I'm a little bit both, about... I'm, I'm open to both options. Um, again, I'm not currently servicing the Nagata area, so we, I think it's wise to look at it both ways. Yep. Um, you do have multilingual staff, though, that you place in other projects, correct? Myself? Yeah. Yeah, we, we cover six languages, and we work on a variety of different projects, including IT. Okay, so if it is your company, how would you then uh, go about placing uh, the right kind of staff at that location? First, I have to do a site survey and see if it's potentially possible. To hire locals, you mean? Uh, both. Both one of mine from Tokyo or training from Tokyo and, yes, local uh, uh, people that would uh, work uh, under my company for the management of the property. <laughs> Okay, well, the existing owners, um, again, there are a couple and they've been doing everything on their own. Um, with the number of bookings that they've got, it might not be too difficult, but hoping that we can increase that, we probably will need some staff on hand. So the options are either to hire locally um, and then you manage them remotely, or you might have people in Tokyo that would be interested in relocating, do you think? Yes, it's possible that I would rotate staff in and out. Okay. And, and, and Paul, according to your experience, um, what are the number of uh, staff uh, we need to run such a setup? Um, again, I really want to be on site and go look at it before I can comment on that. But I mean, at least uh, I, I mean you've got cleaning, maintenance, and uh, let's see, and uh, um, you know, regular uh, floor staff. So I imagine you need at least on call, not a contracted guy for maintenance, um, cleaning staff. Um, how many rooms total, Ziv? 26. Uh, how many? 26. 26? Yeah. Two people uh, available. Um, and then for 26 rooms, probably you need one staff from my side and two locals, I would say, max. And that doesn't include food and beverage. And again, the food and beverage operation could be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, contracted out? Yep. Well, it could be, I mean, those are profit drivers, right? So like in high season, we yes. probably need more staff because we've got more bookings. I guess the same goes for food and beverage. If the place is popular, we'll, we'll happily get more staff. Um, yes. Okay. A any any well, other questions from, from your end? That's about it for the time being. Okay, so what we want to what let's just summarize what's the extra information that we want from the owners at this stage. So you you're asking about um, you're asking about um, potential forward bookings, right? So we want to know exactly um, how much and for which dates they've got advanced bookings in the system. Was there right. was there anything else that we want to ask them? 
Beyond and the- if possible, I think it, it will be great to uh, get more detailed uh, operational information about the last season. Say, for example, the occupancy, the rental, etc., etc., because that's really something. I've uh, added, to I've added a couple of uh, files. I've added a couple of files to the folder. I think I might have not sent you an update, but there are a couple of files that I've added to the folder that got the um, occupancy report for 2018 and 2019. That's uh, a, okay. There's a PDF there that has that. Um, but similar to the income, it's not spectacular. So don't don't expect any uh, any pleasant surprises there. <laughs> Okay. I guess the big question is: Do the current future booking cover the current, the normal expected operating expenses for the next season? Right. Yes. So we definitely want to see what the forward bookings in their system that they've got are and for how long. I mean, I'm guessing if somebody booked for this coming season, that's probably going to have low cancellation rates. But if someone's booking in advance for um, not this season, but the next one, we shouldn't probably count on that because there are going to be some cancellations, I'm guessing. Right. But if you could implement any kind of even, in, in, um, you know, just even the basic, get the marketing and, and the promotion going, even at a very small level, and you could, you know, bring it up to maybe $6 million the, instead of $4 million, uh um, what did you say, Ziv? Did you say 40 or 4? You said 4, right? 4. They said 4 million in advance bookings. I'm not sure if it's just for one season. So if you or... could bring that even up to 6, if I remember correctly, based on what you told me the operating expenses were, uh, that would put the place into the black, at least, barely. Um, yeah, I think from there, let me just open that file again. I think their operating expenses for the last year. Just give me a sec. Um were it's about six million six yen, million I yes that's right operating expenses yeah so 4.3 for the year ending and then, yeah about six million so yeah so i mean if and, and i understand important the most important question but um that's not a huge increase to make the place you know at least break even that's a that's a small number yep and also, I'm not sure if all of these expenses can be uh, somehow reduced. That's, again, something we'll have to see in the site survey. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the other critical question is about the uh, timing of, uh, say, uh, applying for the license. That maybe the current owners could share their experience to us because if, I think it's critical to assess uh, if we can really make the... Uh, business operational for the coming season, which is just a few months away. So uh, if uh, we can still, you know, uh, uh, capture the business in the upcoming season, certainly it will affect the uh, valuation of uh, the whole thing. Um, yeah, the business license itself doesn't take too long, but the, uh, I mean, to set up the company, sorry, doesn't take too long. Um, Paul, assuming that the place is already um, compliant from your experience, how long does it take to apply for the uh, budget hotel license? Really varies based on the location and the government officials involved. They can be very, very accommodating and they can be complete jerks. Um, but to answer your question the best that I can, approximately a month, month and a half. Okay, so it's definitely doable before the next ski season at least. Yeah, but it will be tight, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that that's um, that's enough questions okay. for them. And I'll also okay. I'll also ask them how long it took them to get the uh, food and beverage license because that's the other main component. Zip. Yep. If, if they already have a hotel license, why is it necessary to apply for a different category of hotel license? I'm not sure I'm following that part. Well, they've mentioned um, their emails mentioned that definitely the food and beverage license is not transferable. Um, whether that includes the hotel license or not, I'm not sure. Because you're right, that's per property, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, you use the Rio Con Gyo to basically take an apartment building and change it into uh, a simple, uh, what do they call it? Um, <clears throat> simple lodging budget hotel so that you can operate short term with, with short term uh, reservations 365 days a year. But in this case, you already have a hotel that must be licensed and allows operations 365 days a year. I don't see why there would be any additional licensing requirement, to be honest. 
Okay, so why isn't the hotel license transferable? Um, they might be just wrong about that. They said that that's what their lawyer told them, so I went with that, but they could be wrong. So I'll look into that as well. Any other questions? Uh, no, but but just, that's, uh, one, that's one, one final comment. I mean, even if the hotel license isn't transferable, I mean, it should be a very simple pr process to allow a new owner to essentially obtain the same license, completely different than the Rio Con Gil process, which is a bit of a headache. Um, this this is an existing property it was built for as and registered as a hotel, whereas in the instances of all the other properties, whether you do a Minpaku license or a Rio Con Gyo license, you're actually filing for a change of use. And that's why you have to get the fire department, the architect, and the uh, health department involved. In the current case, you're not filing for a change of use. That's a whole different thing. It's much, much, much better. Okay. Filing for a change of use of a property and getting approval is more or less a nightmare. Gotcha. So this property, we, mm -hmm, yes. So, sorry, go ahead. This property already was built under the current purpose of use. You don't have to file for a change of use. You're simply changing ownership. Okay, so we want to know exactly what kind of license they currently have, and then we want to check maybe with our own legal team um, if that's transferable or not. Yes, I can't imagine that in Japan in 2019 that they don't have a system whereby one party sells a business and another party buys a business and all the operational rights of the business, you know, are easily obtained by the purchasing party. It just wouldn't make any sense. Okay, we'll, we'll look into that. They might have just gotten the wrong legal advice or they might be referring to something else and I misunderstood. So we'll have a look into that. Okay. All right, so that's probably it for now. I'll get back to you with um, uh, answers to uh, any other questions as I get them. Okay, thank you very All much, right. you guys. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Sure. Okay, so there you have it. Good ideas and even better questions all around. Now, here are the answers to those questions as we've just received them from the sellers. So first, the hotel license, which already includes the food and beverage license, is actually registered to a property and owner name combination as one entity. So that can't be transferred as is when the ownership is changed. But the reapplication process uh, takes about four to six weeks from the owner's own experience. And more importantly, the existing license can actually be used until the new license is granted. So the buyer would be able to start operating immediately as soon as they purchase the place. Now, as for the breakdown of the advanced bookings, which are already in the hotel's booking system, these are now actually over 5 million Japanese yen for the coming winter season, and there are new bookings coming in daily. Now, those bookings aren't paid in advance. That's just not the custom in Japan. But from the seller's own experience, again, you can expect just about 10% cancellation uh, on average overall. So the original 4 million Japanese yen estimate still seems to be about right, maybe even a bit conservative, but that's always a good thing. Now, one thing the seller also mentioned is that their breakfast sales aren't included in the bookings estimate. So they've been charging 900 Japanese yen per adult and 600 Japanese yen per child for breakfast. And from their experience, again, about 75%, so three quarters of the guests would normally get breakfast every day during their stays. So some added income there as well. So really our next step now will be to discuss and define the scope for a research visit to the property by Paul and, uh, and or his team, with or without any potential buyers, to try and estimate just how valid those draft business ideas of ours are. We'll have another chat with uh, that or other potential buyers in the coming few weeks to try and define the scope for that visit and research uh, a bit more accurately estimate the cost of the trip, and really the first potential buyer who will agree to pick up the tab for this uh, research excursion would then be first in line and with first right of uh, refusal on the sale. So if there's anyone listening uh, who is interested and wants to put their hand up for potentially purchasing this resort, which remind you is currently priced at 50 million Japanese yen, so less than half a million US dollars, which is again ridiculously cheap for a 26 room fully operational resort in such a beautiful location. So now would be the best time for you guys to jump on that wagon and let us know that you are interested so we can start moving things forward on your behalf and if at all possible reserve you uh, with the first right of refusal. 
Okay, that's it from us for today. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Do share our podcast with your networks, whether it's this episode or the whole thing. We know you're loving it. We're already close to 13,000 full downloads. And you do occasionally send us some feedback, which is great. So we know you're loving it too. But what we're not seeing enough of are actual ratings and reviews. So our average is five stars. Again, we know you're liking it, but there are just not nearly enough actual reviews out there on the iTunes store and the podcast download centers. So please, we know you're busy, but it honestly just takes a minute or two. We'd really appreciate it if you could put in a few words, just write a short review to let us and other listeners know what you think and to help us reach as many people as possible. Hugely appreciated and thank you in advance for that. And lastly... I um, personally will be going on a short holiday starting next weekend for a couple of weeks. I'll do my best to try and make one more episode before that. So if I make it, it'll only be two weeks break. But just in case things get too hectic in the office and I can't make it, it might be three weeks before you hear from me next time. So apologies in advance, but I will be sipping cocktails on a beach in Thailand, which tends to happen once a year. Uh, Still reading and answering emails, of course, so feel free to send in your messages, uh, but I can't really disconnect completely, but just won't have the uh, right environment to record there. So bear with me until uh, late September, if it comes to that. I promise to be back with more content then. Thanks for your time again. Hope to have you with us next time. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, we wish you, as always, happy investing.